Good evening. I'm Ed Murrow. The name of the program is Person to Person. It is live without the use of film. And tonight we invite you again to go visiting. We're going up to Boston to meet Senator John Kennedy and his bride. And then we're going down to Arlington to meet General and Mrs. William Dean. We will be ready in exactly 20 seconds. Long distance, Maine to Florida. The American Oil Company, the drillers who produce oil, the scientists who refine it, the seamen who transport it, the men who deliver it, and the Amoco dealers who serve you, all the Amoco people, calling you person to person. I'm told that all little boys have dreams. Some of them want to be policemen. Others would like to be football stars. Others would like to be a skipper on a Navy ship. Others would like to be newspaper reporters or perhaps a United States senator or married to a most attractive bride. Senator John Kennedy of Massachusetts has accomplished all these things in his 36 years, except being a policeman. This seems to be rather the marrying season for senators. The Kennedys were married last month. They're still looking for a place to live in Washington. On weekdays, they stay up in Boston at what used to be the bachelor establishment of the senator. It's on the third floor of this building that you're looking at now, over a barber shop just on the edge of Beacon Hill. Five blocks away is North Church, where the lanterns were hung on the night of Paul Revere's famous ride. The Boston Massacre also took place not far from here. But so much for the history. Let's go and meet the newlywed. Are you there, Senator? Yes, right here, Mr. Morrow. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Kennedy. Good evening. Uh, I understand that the two of you had a very much publicized courtship. Uh, how did the two of you meet? We met um, at the house of a friend about two years ago. And uh, you used to be a reporter, didn't you? Yes, I did. And uh, you first met the senator when you interviewed him? Well, I, met, I interviewed him shortly after I met him. Well, now, which requires the most diplomacy, to interview senators or to be married to what? Um, well, <laughs> not Being married to one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, have, have you opened all your wedding gifts? Uh, well, I've opened quite a few of them, and I've sent them all to Washington. We just have a couple back here. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, Senator, I wonder if you would show us around your uh, uh, apartment a bit? Certainly will. Fine, tomorrow. Okay. This, uh, I remember when you were over in England, and I thought you uh, might remember this picture that uh, was taken when my family were all over there in 1939 when my father was uh, ambassador. Oh, I remember it very well. There he is in the center, isn't he? Yes, that's right. And I have uh, my eight brothers and sisters. That's almost the last time we were all uh, taken together and uh, brings back uh, happy memories. Well, Senator, you had some uh, rather anxious moments yourself during the war, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, you, uh, you were, you were uh, in PT boats, weren't you? Yes, I was during the Solomon Islands uh, campaign. Uh, we worked off of, uh, first off of Tulagi and then off the Rendover in the uh, New Georgia Islands. And then uh, finally up close to Vela La Vela uh, towards the end of 1943. Is that a model of your PT boat there? Yes, it is. That was made over at, uh, by some friends of mine over at the Boston Navy Yard. The PT on which I was on, PT-109, was uh, cut in two uh, while we were attacking a Jack Jap destroyer in the uh, in the, on August 2nd, 1943, and we more or less hit head on, uh, at least he hit over through here and, and cut through to the end of the boat and uh, proceeded, uh, unfortunately, on his way. We, uh, after about uh, seven or six, six or seven days, we landed on uh, Nauru Island and ran into a native and we gave him a coconut and with a message written on it, which he took back to Rendover. We, when I get back to Rendover a couple of days later, we, I picked up the coconut and I have it here in plastic, with, so it's pretty well uh, shrunk up. But at least it uh, reminds me of an interesting uh, experience. Uh, in interesting. I, I should think that would be one of the great understatements. Uh, Senator, yeah. what's the picture just above the coconut there on the wall? Well, that's a uh, picture of a, uh, the destroyer 
850, which was named after my brother. He was a, uh, uh, after they landed at D-Day, the rocket emplacements, as you remember, were bothering the British, and uh, they sent over some radar-controlled planes, which the pilot was supposed to bail out, and then the plane was to be uh, guided into the target, the rocket emplacement, but the plane blew up too soon, and uh, so this destroyer was named after him uh, uh, by the Navy. Uh, you might uh, be interested to know, to prove that uh, wars sometimes uh, bring people together. During the campaign last summer, it was written up in Time magazine that I was running, and it mentioned our experience in the Solomons, and I got a letter about a month later from the commander of the Japanese destroyer, uh, which ran, ran us down, which turned out to be the Amagiri. He read, uh, when I read the Time magazine of August 18, 1952, which mentioned the battle in question, my memory being refreshed, I can vividly recall what happened at the time. He said, uh, it was early in June 1943, I was transferred to Rabaul as the commander of the destroyer Amagiri. From that time, the counterattack of the American forces became increasingly offensive. In one of the night battles in August 1943, I sighted a bold enemy boat of small size was heading directly towards my destroyer of a larger type. Having no time to exchange gunfire, the ships came so close to each other, my destroyer had to su surprise, uh, my destroyer had to directly hit the enemy boat, slicing it in two. To my great surprise, this boat happened to be the PT, uh, which was under your command. And uh, so that uh, he sent me good wishes in the campaign, and uh, I hope sometime if I ever go to Japan to uh, meet him. Well, Senator, since we're talking about the last war, uh do you think we're ready for an all-out war now, if another should come? Well, I, I think that uh, there is a great deal we have to do. I think, of course, the basic question in which we're now attempting to decide is whether we should attempt to build up and devote a great deal of our money to a strong continental defense system and a effective strategic air force, or whether really the best hope of survival rests in an air force second to none, with retaliatory powers that will be sufficient to force the Russians to hold their hands. Unfortunately, today, I don't think we're doing either. And due to the stretch-outs of 1952 and then again in 1953, in Air Force power, uh, instead of having the 143 air groups that the Chiefs of Staff considered to be the minimum for our defense in 1944, in 1954, we're now only going to have uh, 126 groups by the end of 1956. So that I don't think that a nation which is as rich and powerful as ours uh, should be satisfied with anything less than an Air Force second to none. I don't think today we have it. In addition, I think we have a great deal to do in attempting to build up the strength in our Western European allies. And in addition, I don't think we should resign ourselves to the ultimate prospect of an atomic war, but should attempt to work out uh, some arrangement, perhaps only through being so strong ourselves uh, that we can avert it, because that will be the ruin of everything that is important in this country and all over the world. Well, Senator, let's change to uh, a domestic subject. Uh, you're a member of the Labor Committee, aren't you? Uh, yes, Ms. Morrow. I was in it for six years in the House, and I'm on it now in the, in the Senate. And there's a great deal of talk about changing the Taft-Hartley law. Uh, what's wrong with it, in your view? Well, I, I think that uh, some things are right. Uh, perhaps somebody can answer my <laughs> phone, I guess. <laughs> I think there are some things that are uh, good about it. I think the attempt to provide uh, democracy for the union members do something about national emergencies, though I don't think the provisions are completely satisfactory. And I was for the Communist Affidavit uh, uh, Resolution in 1947. However, I do think that in time of depression, uh, when there was a large group of unemployed, that the Taft Hartley would be a, at least provisions of it. Uh, those provisions, I think the secondary boycott provision is too stern. I think the provision which provides that state, uh, uh, state laws are more harsh on union security arrangements, that they should uh, be superior to the federal law. I think the provision which doesn't permit union members, uh, which permits strike breakers to vote if union members go out on strike, whether there should be a union or not, I think those are some of the provisions that might be changed. I hope we can get some unanimous agreement as we've been talking really about changing the taft Hartley bill since 1947. But I well, see uh, that my wife is back, so we'll get back to... I brought you one of uh, the wedding presents, which I think is Jack's favorite, which is always throwing around this apartment. Well, this uh, present was a present from Jim Farrell, who was in charge of handing out athletic equipment when I was at college at Harvard, and he's uh, still doing it. This probably was the football that Harvard was going to use for his first game, but in any case, he sent it to me, and I certainly appreciated it, and uh, I must say it's probably my favorite. Well, Senator, uh, could I ask you another question on domestic affairs? 
Yes. I'm told that some of your constituents are worried about the possibility of uh, a depression. Do you share their concern in this matter? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Marr, we're still in pretty good shape uh, nationwide, but I, I do know, is, uh, of course, we're all concerned about the drop in farm prices, which was a preliminary, as you remember, to the Depression in 1929. A good farm policy to do something about that uh, has to be the first job, I think, of the coming Congress. In addition, our production uh, index dropped in September over August, and it usually moves up. I don't think there needs to be a depression, and I think if we, or a recession, and I think if we take advantage of our build-in stabilizers in our economy, a strong farm program, uh, boosting up Social Security payments and maybe raising the minimum wage, having a good credit policy, and having an effective fiscal policy, which will stimulate the economy of the country, uh, I think that we can move ahead, and I think it's going to be a vital job because we have to keep people working. If the re we start to slip into a recession, We'll have to reduce taxes more and perhaps increase government spending. But savings are at an all-time high, and I think that if we take effective countermeasures now before it's too late, uh, we are infinitely better off than we were in the late 20s to ward one off. Well, Senator, I understand that you uh, had a lot of tea parties during your campaign. Can you still drink tea? Well, I do. I can because, it, uh, as a matter of fact, I drank it then, and it turned out very well. So I must say I've gotten to like it. Um, do you do, uh, have a chance to do much reading? Yes, uh, well, we, I used to very much, and I uh, uh, try to do it as much as I can now. Uh, have you found anything that uh, has been particularly useful, or uh, perhaps I could use the word inspirational to you? Well, I, I do have uh, something here. It was written by Alan Seagull, who, as you remember, uh, was born in New York and fought uh, in the Foreign Legion and was killed in the First World War in 1916. Yes. He wrote that famous poem, I Have a Rendezvous with Death. And just before he died, he wrote a letter home to his mother, which I think has good advice uh, for all of us. He said, whether I am on the winning or losing side is not the point with me. It is being on the side where my sympathies lie that matters. Success in life means doing that thing than which nothing else conceivable seems more noble or satisfying or remunerative, and then being ready to see it through to the end. I think that's probably good advice for all of us. Well, Senator Kennedy, uh, thank you very much for letting us come to visit you, and will you also express our thanks to Mrs. Kennedy? Thank you very much. It's my sure We appreciate it very much. Uh, we shall be going in just a moment down to Arlington, Virginia, to visit General and Mrs. Dean. Stoplights like this have started a lot of people thinking about gasoline and thinking hard. And here's why. When the light says go, some engines want to stay put. They knock under acceleration. They don't deliver the power they should, at the time they should. They act lazy, sluggish. They seem to sneer, maybe you want to get going, but I don't care. You get mad, and so does the guy behind you. Here's the reason. Engine deposits are there building up, crusty, hard deposits that form on the pistons, combustion chamber walls, and around the valves. They build up and build up and build up, and they cut down engine efficiency. These deposits come from gasoline. Gasoline that leaves a hard, crusty, metallic deposit. Gasolines that don't burn completely and cleanly. And that's why stoplights are starting so many motorists to use Amoco gas. Amoco gas leaves no metallic deposit at all. It burns cleanly and keeps engines clean because it's the only special motor fuel whose anti-knock values are refined into the gas, not added later. For protection against metallic deposit, for the best engine performance, use Amoco Gas, the world's original special motor fuel. Get it at the Amoco sign of greater values from Maine to Florida. It was just eight weeks ago that the communists in Korea released their highest ranking American prisoner, Major General William Dean, who was taken near Taejeon in July of 1950. He spent three years in an enemy prison camp, if you can call it a camp. He received our highest decoration, the Congressional Medal of Honor. And the citation said, among other things, that his was an example of excessive gallantry always committed at threatened portions of the front. The citation tells how General Dean, while alone, attacked an enemy tank single-handed with hand grenades. And it says that the general was in large measure responsible for the heroic leadership, his courageous and loyal devotion to his men, 
and his complete disregard for his personal safety. General and Mrs. Dean live in Berkeley, California, but now they're visiting in Arlington, Virginia, about six miles from the Pentagon. In the years before the Korean War, when General Dean was military governor of South Korea, the deputy governor was Major General Charles Helmick. General Helmick frequently described this house to General Dean, and he used to ask him to drop in when he was next in that part of the country. So tonight, the General and Mrs. Dean are the guests of General and Mrs. Helmick. Are you there, General Dean? I'm right here. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Is Mrs. Dean there? Yes, this is Mrs. Dean, Mr. Good Murrow. E Good evening, Mrs. Dean. Good evening, Mr. Murrow. General, uh, how's your health? How are you feeling? In splendid health, sir. Excellent condition. Uh, do you agree with that, Mrs. Dean? Yes, he certainly is. Well, General, I'd like to put to you a first question. You've been back in the States about six weeks now, haven't you? Exactly six weeks. And what has impressed you most since your return? Other, the thing that has impressed me most is the cordiality of the welcome that I've received from the people. Other than that, it's been the disciplined driving that I've noted in my own state on the highways in California. Well, sir, we know something about the treatment that you received in prison. But what, what has been the, the, the greatest, the most appreciated physical comfort you've had since coming home? The greatest physical com comfort has been that of liberty, of immersion baths where I can get in a bathtub, and of being able to eat the foods to which I, which I used to enjoy so much, especially dairy products. General, uh, uh, while you were in that prison camp, you had probably more time to think than any man in the armed services in the last three years. What, what particularly did you worry about? My greatest concern was the sense of my inadequacy, of my failure during the 20 days that I fought before I was captured. I felt that we hadn't stopped the North Koreans because of my own inadequacy. Then you didn't expect to return home if you ever did as a hero with the Congressional Medal? No, anything but that. I expected when I returned that I might even be tried for not having done better, for not having fulfilled my obligations to my country. And did you also think occasionally of what happened to you while you were attempting to escape before you were actually captured? Yes, I often thought of my woodenness, my obtuseness in being so easily ambushed. Well, Mrs. Dean, um, what, what did you think when you heard that the general had been taken prisoner? Well, I, uh, I can say that I truly never really lost hope that we always had hope, and I've always said that uh, my husband was indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly demonstrated that. Uh, General, I know you've been checking with uh, the parents of some of the men who were with you in that great and gallant 24th Division. Have you discovered anything since you uh, returned? How, yes. how much information have you acquired? I've acquired a great deal information of what has happened to those that were taken prisoners or those whose bodies have been recovered. A great many of those that I've inquired, we have as yet obtained no positive information. Well, it's unlikely that we will, isn't it, sir? Because according to the official announcement issued by the Army, it is claimed that we have evidence that almost 30,000 Allied troops and civilians were murdered by the enemy. The communists killed by torture, fire, drowning, Almost 12,000 Allied soldiers, and of these, 6,113 were American soldiers. It seems to add up to this, that one out of every five United Nations soldiers who died in Korea was actually murdered by the communists. It seems to me that this is something of a factual denial of the communist claim that prisoners of war were well treated. H how do you explain these brutalities, these atrocities, General? I explain these brutalities in that I feel that the communists want to put fear into the hearts of men throughout the field work, the free world. They want to win by any means, and they feel that fear is one of the surest means. 
Then would you say, sir, that these pictures that we have seen in the papers in the last day or two are authentic? I would. I think that I know that they're the best evidences, authentic evidences, that our intelligence agencies can get. That's a picture of uh, South Korean women, is it not, sir? Yes, this is a picture of 12 women that were found in Wales, put there by the North Koreans as they withdrew. Here's a picture of a North Korean command post with five of our soldiers murdered just before they had left that command post. That is, before the North Koreans yes, had left it. Here's a picture of one of my own soldiers at Chochawan with his hands bound behind him and murdered without a chance. Here's another one of my soldiers, the bodies of one of my soldiers, found at Chochawan, <coughs> bound and murdered. Well, General, you spoke a moment ago of uh, the communist effort to create fear in this country. Do you think they've succeeded? I do not, but they have awakened the people of America to what kind of an enemy we're facing. And I feel that knowledge of the methods that have been used and will most likely be used in the future well, may awaken us. If you know what kind of an enemy you're fighting, you're better prepared to fight a real battle. Well, General Dean, I know that you were interrogated for long hours. I think it was 76 hours continuously when you were first taken. Did they ever attempt to frighten you, or did they torture you in any way? They never tortured me in any way. They made me uncomfortable while they tortured me. I mean, while they questioned me, but they never tortured me. They kept me under constant interrogation for 68 hours at one stretch, 42 at another, and 32 at another, but they never tortured me. What did you tell them in the course of that interrogation? Well, in the course of that interrogation, I told them nothing that they wanted to know. But when they asked me, well, that, that's a hard one to ask. I don't know what I did tell them. I mean, they, they were they were apparently uh, trying to extract from you, amongst other things, the defense plans for Japan, were they not? That was the principal item in the latter part of the question. Well, uh, General, let me ask you another question. Uh, during this three-year period, what happened that gave you any pleasure or satisfaction in any way? Well, the greatest physical satisfaction I had, I mean the greatest satisfaction, not physical satisfaction, the greatest satisfaction I had was receiving letters from home. From uh, your daughter and your wife, I take it. I received letters from my family, including my wife and daughter, also from friends. But I received more letters from my daughter than from anyone else. That's your daughter, June, who presented you with a grandson and a granddaughter while you were there, is it not? That's right. What was the greatest food treat you had while you were there, General? The greatest food treat I had was a can of cheese, a number 10 can a Wisconsin Blue Moon Cheese, which was given to me on the 8th of February this year in celebration, so they said, of Inman Goon Day. That means the North Korean Army Day. I made that cheese last six weeks. I took a spoonful with each meal. It was wonderful. Uh, General, I take it that uh, there was a guard physically present in the room with you all the time. Is that not true? At all times until 5th of August this year. Well, sir, you, uh, I know from talking with you the other day, you kept very close track of the time. Uh, you had no calendar. You had no watch. How did you keep track of the time? I kept track of the time by marking on the floor in the dirt, as I'll show you here, the current day. Immediately after breakfast, I'd raise the straw mat when the guard wasn't looking, rub out the date, and put the current date down. That manner. And were you always sitting on the floor in that position? That's, uh, that's right. I see. And what about your guards? Did they perform roughly the same duties that American guards would? The same duties, 
except that each guard put in two hours of political study each day. And in addition to the two hours of political study, the members of the guard would gather and hold a seminar on the matter studied that day. It well, sir, in, in the course of this three-year term, uh, did you uh, uh, develop any thoughts about the training of American soldiers? I, <coughs> I was convinced that I had not sufficiently stressed the I and E training of our own soldiers. And I resolved that if I ever return to active duty with my soldiers of the United States, that I would stress to a much greater degree the I and E program. That is uh, information and education. Information and education on our own institutions. Well, sir, uh, from what you have seen since you came home, and judging by your mail, which I know has been very considerable, uh, how do you think this struggle is going? I feel that there is a greater realization on the parts of my on the part of my countrymen than there was before I left. I do feel that there are some groups that don't give full thought to what they're doing and they're attempting to drive certain organizations underground. I feel it's better to have open platform parties with which the majority does not agree, but have them open. Let people say what they believe, but let there be liberty for which we've been fighting. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. And I think at uh, the possible risk of embarrassing you, I would like to read just a little from the citation or your Medal of Honor. He personally and alone attacked an enemy tank while armed only with a hand grenade. He refused to ensure his own safety in withdrawal, but remained behind organizing the retreating forces. He was last seen assisting the wounded to places of safety. His examples of excessive gallantry committed always at threatened portions of the front line. We have been talking with General William Dean, who is eight weeks back from a PW camp in Korea. And we'll be back in a moment. Hi, friends. I'm Bob Dixon. Well, old autumn has already clothed all the trees in their Halloween costumes. And tomorrow night is the night. So unless you enjoy scraping soap off windows, better be sure to have your car put in a safe place. That's just a good precaution to take. Now, uh, you know I'm leading up to something, don't you? Well, that's right. Another good precaution to take this time of year is to get your car all set for winter. When the weather gets snappy, your car gets balky. If it doesn't have a lighter, faster flowing grade of motor oil, like Amoco's wonderfully new Permalube motor oil. And this time of year, your car needs chassis and gear lubricants that won't congeal in freezing weather. It needs special attention to the battery. It needs one fill ammo antifreeze. In short, it needs a complete going over by your Amico man. He'll give you the best changeover service your car ever had. Give him a chance to prove it, will you? And now here's Ed Murrow. Tonight we have been visiting with Senator and Mrs. John Kennedy in Boston and with General William Dean and Mrs. Dean in Arlington, Virginia. There you see the names of some of the many people who contributed to this program. We would also be churlish if we failed to acknowledge the great help that we had from WNAC in Boston and from WMAL in Washington, D.C. There is time enough to say good night and good luck from person to person. Here's tonight's See It Now on the CBS Television Network. <laughs>